Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I've lived in my house for over 15 years and have never had any issues with neighbors until Sheila moved in next door. I first met her when she was moving boxes into the house and came over to introduce myself and welcome her to the neighborhood. Hi there, I'm John, your next door neighbor. Just wanted to welcome you to the neighborhood, I said. Oh thanks, I'm Sheila, she replied, barely looking up from her phone. I tried to make a little more small talk, but she clearly wasn't interested, so I just wished her well and went back home. The first couple weeks she lived there, I hardly saw her. Her husband would come and go occasionally, but other than that, the house was quiet. One Saturday morning, I was out doing yard work when I noticed Sheila sitting on the back patio staring at me. I smiled and waved, but she just kept glaring in my direction. I shrugged it off and kept working until I needed a break. I took off my shirt and jumped in my pool to cool down a bit. As soon as I got in the pool, I heard Sheila yelling from her yard. Excuse me, what do you think you're doing? she shouted. I poked my head out of the water, confused. Uh, just taking a quick dip in my pool, I replied. Your pool? I don't think so. That pool is on my property, which makes it my pool. I don't appreciate you trespassing and using my pool without my permission, Sheila said angrily. Now I was really confused. I'm sorry, but this pool is definitely on my property. I've lived here for over 15 years and this pool has always been mine, I explained. That's nonsense. The property line clearly shows the pool on my side. I'll be calling the police if you don't get out immediately, she threatened. I didn't want to cause more of a scene, so I reluctantly got out of the pool and went back inside, completely bewildered by what had just happened. The next day, I double-checked my property survey just to be sure. The pool was exactly where it had always been, entirely on my property. I figured I would go over and try to smooth things over with Sheila and straighten out the misunderstanding. When I rang her doorbell, she came to the door looking annoyed. What do you want? she demanded. Hi, Sheila. I just wanted to come by and show you my property survey. As you can see, the pool is well within my property line and has been since it was installed over ten years ago, I said politely. Sheila glanced at the survey and tossed it back at me. That survey is wrong. I had my own done yesterday, and the pool is on my property. You have no right to be swimming in my pool whenever you feel like it, she snapped. This woman was unbelievable. I'm sorry, but that simply isn't true. I've owned this house for 15 years, and that pool has always belonged to me. I'm happy to get our lawyers involved if needed, but the pool is definitely mine, I said firmly. Sheila scowled at me. We'll see about that. The police will sort this out once and for all, she spat and then slammed the door in my face. I walked back home, frustration mounting. I had tried to be reasonable, but clearly this woman was out of her mind. The next morning I woke up planning to relax and swim some laps. I put on my swim trunks and grabbed a cup of coffee. The second I stepped foot outside, I heard Sheila yelling from her yard, I told you that you cannot use my pool. You are trespassing on my property. I'm calling the police, she screamed. I froze, coffee still in hand as she aggressively dialed and then began loudly talking to the police dispatcher. Yes, I need to report a trespasser at my home. My neighbor keeps swimming in my pool without my permission. I've asked him to stop, but he won't listen. I need an officer here immediately to arrest him, she ranted. I stood there in shock as she hung up, a smug grin on her face. The police will be here any minute. You're going to jail for trespassing, she taunted. I was fuming at this point. This is absolutely absurd. I have not set foot on your property. This is my pool on my land. I'm not sure what kind of game you're playing here, but the police will clearly see the property line and that I am in the right, I shouted back. Mm, we'll see about that, she sneered. A few minutes later, a police car pulled up. The officer got out and approached me in the backyard. Good morning, officer. I'm sure my neighbor Sheila called you, but I just want to clarify that this is my property and my pool. She is mistaken, but convinced the pool belongs to her, I calmly explained. The officer turned to Sheila, who was watching smugly from her yard. Ma'am, can you explain the dispute over the pool to me? He asked. Sheila launched into a tirade about how I kept trespassing to swim in her pool and refused to stop. The officer listened patiently, then came back over to me. Do you have documentation showing the property line and who owns the pool? He asked. Yes, absolutely, I replied, quickly grabbing my property survey. I showed him the exact property line and the pool location clearly on my side. The officer examined it carefully, comparing it to the physical landmarks. 
He then walked over to Sheila. Ma'am, I've looked at the property survey and inspected the property line. The pool is definitively on your neighbor's property. He has every right to use it as he chooses, he informed her. Sheila's face turned red with anger. That can't be right! I just had a survey done that showed the opposite. This man is trespassing and he needs to be arrested immediately, she screamed unhinged. The officer shook his head. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I've determined he is not trespassing based on the documentation he's provided. If you disagree, you'll need to take the matter to civil court, but I will not be arresting him today. Sheila was absolutely seething, screaming about suing me and having me thrown in jail. The officer advised me I should consider getting a restraining order given her behavior. I thanked him profusely as he left. Over the next week, Sheila constantly watched me from her yard any time I went near my pool, but thankfully didn't approach me again. Then late one night I was startled awake by flashing police lights outside. I went to the window to see two police cars pulling up. My heart sank imagining what Sheila had concocted this time. I watched as the officers questioned Sheila on her front lawn. She was waving papers around and pointing aggressively at me. Then the officers walked over to my house and rang the doorbell. I answered and nervously asked what was going on. Sorry to disturb you, sir, but we received a call that you are trespassing on your neighbor's property again. She has a restraining order against you that we need to enforce, the officer explained. My jaw dropped. A restraining order? I hadn't gone near her property. This is insane. I haven't done anything illegal. She has been harassing me over a pool that's on my property. I should be the one to get a restraining order against her, I exclaimed. The officers could see my confusion. Do you have any documentation to prove your side of things? They asked. I quickly retrieved my property survey and all the paperwork confirming I owned the pool legally. The officers examined everything carefully, comparing it to Sheila's documents. After several minutes, they came back over to me. Sir, we've thoroughly reviewed both sides and we believe your documentation is valid. The pool is on your property and you have not been trespassing as claimed in the restraining order. That order appears fraudulent and we will be following up on that with Miss Sheila, they said. I was so relieved. The officers went back to Sheila and after a loud, heated exchange, they left without arresting me, much to Sheila's shrieking dismay. The next week, I installed security cameras covering my entire yard just in case Sheila tried anything again. I also started the process of getting my own restraining order against her since her harassment was now constant. It's been two months since Sheila moved in and my peaceful life has been turned upside down but I've learned I need to protect myself against unstable, litigious people like her. With security footage and the law on my side, I can finally relax, at least when I'm in my own backyard pool. The next one is a pro-revenge story. My grandma recently told me this story about how her brother got his ass kicked from the grave. Sorry for the bad English. I do not write very well, and I have dyslexia. So sorry if I butcher the text. So this is the scenario. My grandma comes from a family of five, four girls, one boy. My great-grandfather, Hank, was ecstatic about the boy. We will call him Jack. One more important thing is that my great-grandfather ran a very successful company that made high-end clothing and bathroom silks, towels, and bathrobes. He made a fortune with his company and made sure everyone who worked for the company got their fair share. He also looked after the family. All his children got an education. All his children got the chance to get their driver's license. It was the 1960s, so it was a big deal back then. They were the first in my hometown with a car, radio, and TV. My great-grandfather treated everyone equally, but that changed when his first and only son was born. He already had four girls and now finally a son. The road map was laid out for him. He would be the heir to his company. So began the upbringing of Jack. He was, let's say, a kid with a mouth. This wasn't bad per se. The thing was that his father allowed it. Jack got kicked out of his first school. Jack got caught shoplifting. Jack got kicked out of his second school. Jack got caught joyriding and so on and so forth. Hank did not sit Jack down and tell him the severity of his actions, but he would shrug it off and tell his wife, great-grandmother Anna, that they were just childhood quirks. Anna tried to make something out of Jack, but it was a lost cause. Jack became 18 and Hank decided that it was time to introduce him to the company. The company did better than ever and the whole family was involved. Jack began at the bottom of the ladder and had to work his way up. This is where Jack began to shine. By shine, my grandmother meant that her brother was not a bright light at school, but he was a hard worker and had a nose for business, not so much for people. 
Jack was being an ass, as per usual, and got married to his first Karen. His first wife was a Karen. She wanted to start her own company, and her father-in-law Hank wanted to retire. She pushed Jack to take over quickly and push the rest of the family out. Jack listened to her and talked to his father about how he was ready and how his sisters and their husbands were tearing the company apart if they would stay in their leadership roles. The thing was that only one daughter and son-in-law were involved in the company at this point, 1980. My grandmother oversaw the seamstresses and the quality department, and my grandfather oversaw the financial and the suppliers. Karen wanted full control and started a little fire in the family. She spread a rumor that grandfather stole from the company. I do not know what transpired, but in the end, my great-grandfather bought out all the family, and Jack bought out great-grandfather. The company was Jack and Karen's company now, and things went tits up pretty quickly. Seamstresses quit, bills were not paid, and Jack had to take a loan from great-grandfather. The family company was barely scraping by, and Karen left Jack because he could not provide for her. It became apparent that Jack could not make it work and was looking for a way out. After a while, great-grandfather had seen enough and bought back the remnants of his company and sold it to a bigger company that wanted to expand. This made the wealth he amassed even bigger. He did set up different banking accounts for his children and said that if someone was in need they could take money from that account. He told Jack his cut was smaller as he was the reason he sold the company and that he was let down by the carelessness his son had run his company into the ground. Jack was angry and told his father that he could have made it work if he had more time. It remained a sour point between the two of them. Things went well for a while, but Jack married a second time with a woman named Helen. Helen, like Karen, wanted her own business. Jack agreed and took money from the account to start Helen's company. The business was a little barber shop and ran pretty well. They were spending their money on luxury and did not save any money. After a while, my grandmother got a call from her little brother Jack if he could store some goods in her garage. My grandfather did not trust Jack and told him no, and grandmother did not agree, but they agreed to it. A few weeks later, Jack got caught for the possession of stolen goods and drug smuggling. It was not a surprise, but nonetheless a letdown for my great-grandfather Hank. This time he would not help Jack and told him that he would no longer stand behind him. After a few years, Jack got out and was again a divorced man. He married again and divorced another three times, and each time he gave these women a business and lived lavishly, new cars, big houses, expensive vacations. He drained his money and robbed his emergency bank account dry. He loaned a lot of money from great-grandfather and so on. In 2013, great-grandfather fell ill. It was clear that he was not going to make it and took his final days in stride. At this time, Jack became very buddy-buddy and started to help great-grandfather sell some stuff. At some point, my grandmother sat down with her father and asked him where the money went for the sold stuff, and great-grandfather told her not to worry about it. He took care of it in his will. After his 95th birthday, he passed away quietly and in peace. After her funeral, they all went to listen to the will of their father all except Jack, who had given a power of attorney to my grandmother to sign the will in his place. All the children got their fair share, but in the end, the notary public told them to sign the papers, and the inheritance was completely theirs. At some point, my grandma called my dad. She had inherited some collateral papers, all sorts of papers that stated that someone owed my great-grandfather money. My father said that she had to call a lawyer's office to get the money from these papers. A few days after this call to the lawyer's office, my grandmother got a call from her brother. Why was she taking his money from the inheritance? My grandmother told him she had inherited some collateral papers and that she wanted to get the money from them. Jack was furious and told her that that was illegal. Jack was wrong. Great-grandfather had documented every penny his son had loaned from him and constructed his will in such a way that the rest of his children could get that part of their money from their money-draining brother. Also, great-grandfather found out Jack stole from him. You see, Jack was putting the money he made from the sold stuff into his own banking account instead of giving it to his father. After this ordeal, Jack has not contacted my grandmother or his sisters. He has since then paid everything back and has never seen a penny from his inheritance. Great-grandfather has confided in a letter why he did this. He was done with his son, all the lying, the careless things he had done to his company, all the money he had blown, 
and not taking any responsibility. He gave his final lesson to his son from the grave. The next one is a petty revenge story. Years before the issue neighbor moved in, we had signed a lease agreement that included exclusive use and care of the yard. We lived in an upstairs-downstairs duplex and had the downstairs. It was common for upstairs apartments like this to have no yard rights in the lease. We allowed the previous tenants to use our things and would have let her had she not been such an issue and rude. Her kid did not live with her and was there on average one day a week. This neighbor was under the impression that if they could see it, it was shared, including things in my house. Our upstairs neighbor moved in late fall. We used our yard year-round and still had fully legal fires in the winter. Around spring, she started bothering the manager about it. She wants to use the yard and we won't let her, and her kid keeps asking, and we are telling her kid no. I was shocked. We had never talked to the child at all, nor her about the yard. And the manager had not brought it up to us. Plus, I'm not a monster. The kid could play in the yard without asking. I heard her saying this outside very loudly on the phone. We tried working things out through the manager, went through different options, her, us, front yard, our backyard split. Front and left, her. Side yard split back and right side yard split. Front left side and 70% of the backyard and small walkway access out our back door to the right side yard. All a big fat no neighbor did get their fire pit after they were told they couldn't use ours and threw a fit about it, but failed to pay attention to safety guidelines. This included having a 6FT plus fire 5 effort from our duplex. Cop was not called but should have been. We were not home at the time. Also video of her and her friends laughing about how it's about to go up and how they have no water to stop it and laughing harder about how it could burn the house down. Luckily, our dogs and we weren't home at the time. At this point, the daily harassment was insane. She stomped so hard she broke a window in our unit under her stairs. My dog started ripping his hair out from stress because of the nonstop impact noise. We later found out it was a basketball upstairs. We moved our dogs out for their health and safety. Then it was petty revenge. We removed everything we owned from the yard. The fire pit, the patio chairs, tables, firewood, horseshoe pits, down to our rocks, everything. Only left what we did not own, which was nothing but the yard. Most of our stuff we gave to our next-door neighbor. Then we told the manager she can have the exclusive use of the yard and all that comes with it. The care landscaping. The manager was more than happy to get her off her back about yard use, and asked when we would be giving her the key to our lawnmower. I laughed and said, No, she can't use my mower. Even if I did let her, she wouldn't do it. That's your problem now. If I can't use the yard without being harassed, she might as well have it. This is on you. Eventually, they got the point and hired someone to care for the lawn as there was no way she would, even if she had a mower. We had doorbell cameras at this time that covered our back door and backyard, as well as the front yard. She used the backyard once to drag her baby in circles around the house. Once she saw all our stuff was gone and she couldn't use it, she was pissed and never used the yard again. Turns out she didn't want the yard. She wanted the stuff we owned in the yard. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I work in a manufacturing facility. We had a technician who knew almost everything about our machines, how to fix them, troubleshoot them, and handle all their weird quirks. When other technicians struggled to find the problem, he came through and saved a lot of downtime sometimes up to hours per shift. He moved to a different department with slightly different hours for personal reasons, which was understandable. He's still there for six hours during our shift, so he's well within reach if things need to escalate. So he told my boss and me, if a machine is ever down for longer than an hour, call me. One day our technicians couldn't find the root cause of a problem. An hour passed and I called him on the walkie-talkie. Then I received a message from the technician's boss, whom I really enjoy working with, asking me not to call this technician over from his department because of morale reasons. You got it, technician boss. So now, whenever we have a problem with a machine, it will stay down for as long as it takes to get fixed or passed down to the next shift, which has engineers and more support staff on call. The next one is an entitled people story. I, 22F, got hurt yesterday and had to get stitches on my left foot. I am currently staying at my parents' house with my dad and younger brother, 18M, for summer break. Since my mom is on vacation, I do everything around the house. My dad and brother both work, so it makes sense and it doesn't bother me, often including grocery shopping, though my dad does that as well. 
My brother is a very picky eater and always cooks for himself since he doesn't like anything we eat at home. Every single day he complains that the fridge is empty, even when there's clearly a ton of food that we just bought. At the same time, he never comes along when we go grocery shopping and refuses to tell us what to buy for him when we ask. If I ask him what he wants me to buy, he says he doesn't know and apparently expects me to just guess exactly what he wants to eat. Today he woke up and started yelling about how there is nothing for him to eat. My dad went grocery shopping last night so there's definitely a lot of food in the fridge and demanded that I go grocery shopping since my dad is working and my brother doesn't have a driver's license. I told him I can barely walk on my left foot and I would like to rest since I was at the ER until 1 a.m. this morning. I offered to cook some pasta carbonara for him since it's something I know he eats, but he said I don't know how to make it and that it would suck. I listed other meals he could make with what we have in the fridge, but he doesn't want to hear any of it. Guess who the spoiled sibling is? Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.